Respite. Jacob didn't share his cold brew, and he's upset about that. <sighs> I understand that. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Let me find a verse here that I want you to memorize for next week. Let me get to it here. It's going to be 15 and 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 3. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Nobody's getting anything next week. That's right. What? Second, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. Actually, I mean, I, I think I know these. All. I almost know these. That's not fair, though. Like at least 10 minutes, right? Because of the rhythm. These are hard, and I can't wait to hear Malachi say some of these words. And Abigail. And and uh, Timothy, yes. I can't wait to hear them say these words. I love hearing the little children say these words. It cracks. And charity. Oh, it's so funny. I love hearing the way they talk. It's great. Oh, right? By the way. Levi got his verses. He got, was it Mark 12, 29, and 30? He did an absolute excellent job with that today. Amen. That was good. He did a great job. He came up and he said it so softly, I could almost not hear him, so I had to get real close to him. But he had them memorized. He did a great job. So good for him. Amen. That's good. All right. So keep working at it. And I try, by the way, when they come up, I, I try to help them a little bit. I give them a little bit of cues once in a while when they need it. There's nothing wrong with that. You remember, this is to encourage them, not to discourage them. We're not trying to beat them over the head if they don't get something right, right? Yeah, get the back. I had to do that to my daughter. I sent her in the back of the line. I was like, all right, you go back there and start working on it a little bit more. I did send my daughters back. I won't do that to yours, but I'll do it to mine. Right? I do, I do it to mine. You all right, you too. Two youngest ones. I was like, all right, get in the back of the line and go study with your mother. So they had to do it. And then they came back and they had it right. Right? So the little ones, it's okay. You know, you want to help them and encourage them. to Because they're doing good. They're doing really good. They've memorized a lot of verses. So that's important. They're going to need those later on in life. 
right? We all need them, don't we? So to have those memorized now and hide them in their hearts, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dave. That's right. So we're going to use these two verses. And, and we're going to use this because these two verses, because the title of this is, is called The Third Century Rise of the Perverted Church Model. All right? It's the third century rise of the perverted church model. Because here is where the model of the local New Testament church begins to change. At the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century, we find, and heading into the fourth century, what we find is, a, is, a, is, a, is kind of a morphing and a changing of the, church, the simple church model. Right? It changed from what the apostles had ordained and laid down in the scriptures, what Christ said would be his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. So then what would happen is men would arise and they would fight that. They would have a problem with that. They would say, they would look at that, what was in the scriptures, they would say, you know what? No, that's not what the Bible says. God didn't say that. That's not the design of the scripture. That's not the way the churches were supposed to be governed. So there, there began the rise of the Metropolitanites, those men that would come, and they would basically start to commandeer churches. More men that had men that had greater influence that were probably in a lot of ways good men. It doesn't mean, listen, here's the thing. Sometimes men don't have evil motives. Sometimes they're not, they're not being evil uh, for the sake of being. Sometimes these men come along. Like you will find that men in history um, that fought heresy and they fought different things, sometimes they would fight it so aggressively that they would lose sight of, of the scriptural importance of staying within the boundaries God gave them. They weren't, like I would say, I would say in fairness, Oliver Cromwell was one of those men, I think. I think Oliver Cromwell, in his, in his quest, and I haven't studied his life, but just some things that I've heard about him, uh, he was called the Lord Protector of England, right? And, and Cromwell did a lot of great things in the beginning. I mean, he actually had Baptists in his army. He fought against popery. He, but, he, but he began to almost take, if you're not careful, what you're fighting against, you'll become. And, and, and it's not, and I think he was saved. I think he was. I, th I think some of those kings in the Old Testament, some people say, well, they killed somebody with this. They must not have been saved. No, I don't think that's the case. I think some of them were. I think they got carried away. Right? They got carried away. And that's what happened to some of these men like Cromwell and others. I think, I don't think they were, they were evil men. I think that they got carried away. And sometimes when you're fighting that, you've got to remember that that fight is not all that you do. As a pastor, I have to remember, and what God has shown me over the last couple years is, yes, you're, you're a soldier, but you're also a pastor. <laughs> and you've got to pastor people. There's people that need you. So you're, you're, you're going to, they need to be, they, they need to know about heresies. They need to be warned about all those things. But they, but they also need to be fed. They need to be fed good doctrine. They need to be fed Christ. And they need to have a good portion of him in every meal. So, you know, there, there's things that you learn along the way as a leader and as somebody like that. You're going to learn that along the way as you go. And in your Christian walk and in your life, you're going to learn the same thing. Well, what happened was some of these men were very zealous for right. But what happened was, and others just, they flat out weren't. But what happened was others they took it too far, and they took their, and they started to control churches. They started to build up, and they, 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 they changed the model of the local New Testament church. They, tr they tried to change it, and obviously, there's going to be some men that, don't, that didn't like that, and they weren't going for that, right? Uh, a group of those men would be men like the Donatist that we're going to talk about soon. Uh, the Donatist, they rose up. These guys, uh, they rose up and fought the Roman hierarchy. They said, no, the Bishop of Rome's not going to tell us who our pastor is going to be. Augustine, others, they're not going to come around and tell us who our pastor is going to be. They're not going to do that. We're going to elect our own pastor. We're going to elect our own bishop. So they started to change these titles. Things started to change a little bit. There was a hierarchy that moved in. 
Let's pray. Father, Lord, help us. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Help us with this lesson, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in a couple different books today. Uh, we're we're going to deal with uh, Brother Beller's book on the, the third century. Uh, and then we're going to get into a little bit of uh, Armitage here. And we're going to get into a little bit of J.T. Christian and maybe touch on a few others, and then we'll be done here. But but uh, not a lot of, lot of long reading, but just a few things to kind of give you the idea of one short lesson of, of, of where the rise of that perverted church model came in. When did they stop, like, becoming, when did they stop becoming, uh, you know, local New Testament churches? When were they starting to, what, what did they do? Well, a hierarchy moved in. What are we warned about uh, in the scriptures? What was warned to us? Who remembers a warning? Shall enter in, not sparing the flock. Good. That's right. And of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. What? Yep, that's right, though. We are an angel for the gospel. What, though, specific, what church warning was given that this was going to come? Or that was already there and was prophetic to look forward to there, were, there was a church there at that time like that? And that there would be, I believe that what Revelation chapter 2 teaches us is that these are all types of churches. There, there are seven different types of churches. And all, that's, that's just basically how many there are. There are seven different types of them. There was a group or a class of men that were warned about. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans right? Which I also hate. It was a spiritual hierarchy, okay? It was like a hierarchy of between, like, laymen and, and um, you know, a b archbishops, uh, metropolitanite, those that would come, a group of persons. All right, a metropolitan is a, is a bishop in the second and third century who exercised power over several pastors and churches at the same time. Hierarchy is a group of persons who exist in a chain of command. So they started to... To set up Now, this is not speaking of in the local church. We know that the office of a bishop in the local church is over one church, right? Now, we may start another work, but that's technically not another church until it's separated. And if they didn't have an elder and they asked for somebody to come in and preach and to help them, then we could do that, but it's all voluntary. The minute they said, we don't want you here anymore, we walk away and say, okay, bye. We don't, we don't have any claim to it. We don't have anything. Now, if we organize and start another church, if we start another one, then it is under the authority of this church until it is a separate body. And then we're no longer in control. They can ask us for advice if they want. They could ask us for any of that. But we're Old Paz Baptist Church, when it reproduces another church, is not going to tell that other church after it's separated, well, you have to follow everything we do or else, you know, we're going to take control or whatever. We're going to do that. No, nope, they're, they're on their own. They're on their own. That's the way it goes. And that's from that sense. That doesn't mean we wouldn't help them and extend a hand to help them, but it means that we won't tell them what to do. We'll give them advice. It's just like, it's kind of like your children when they get older. You're not going to be able to tell them what to do. When they're out on their own and they're making decisions, but they ought to love you enough and, and care for you enough to come for advice. Right? They ought to come to you for advice and they ought to heed it if it's good advice. If it's good biblical advice, they ought to heed it, but we can't force them to. We're never going to be able to force them to, right? So that's how it should be with a church's children as well. So, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, a priestly order. That's what was starting to move in. It was starting to come in in the third century, this priestly order. So a uh, hierarchy is a group of persons who exist in a chain of command. Right? So we have that, and we have a metropolitan, which is a bishop of the 2nd or 3rd century, which we talked about before, uh, and, and we'll get to a little bit more here. So Brother Beller goes on to say this. He says, changing the churches of the 3rd century. To sum up the first three centuries of church history, Carroll wrote this. This is B.H. Carroll, uh, or, or excuse me, J.M. Carroll, The Trail of Blood, which I've been reading actually this week. Where's my briefcase at? I think I need to get that. Brother Scott, go through the secret files here. And uh, back here, this is where the secrets are. Don't tell anybody, all right? Don't watch this, okay? You don't know that's there. Okay, thank you. See that? That's the te secret teaching. It's right, you didn't see it. That's correct. Now you understand, Lee. 
Okay, good. We'll read to right there. We're going to if, – if he didn't cover it, I'll cover it. But anyway, um, during the first three centuries, congregations all over the East subsisted in separate independent bodies, unsupported by government, and consequently without any secular power over one another. All this time they were baptized churches, and through all – and, and though all the fathers of the first four ages down to Jerome, AD 370, were of Greece, Syria, and Africa, and though they give great numbers of histories of the baptism of adults, yet there is not one of the baptisms of a child till the year 370. Now, that's not even infant baptism. That was a baptism of a child. They didn't really record baptism of children. I don't think they baptized a whole lot of children when they were, they were young. They were very careful about that. About, and the reason why, and we're very careful about that, okay? Uh, there's no hard set rule in Scripture that says a certain age. But I'm very cautious about how soon I baptize somebody. Here, some of your children were saved for a while. Some of my children were saved for a few years. And we waited until they were older, until they were, you know, 12, some of them 12, 13, 14 years old. My son was 15, I think, this year. And we waited, you know, for a while. Why? Because we want to see if, if there's fruit in their life and they're serious about it. Now, I don't think you have to wait too super long when but but with a child you have to you want to make sure that they understand salvation want to make sure they understand the scriptures i don't think they have to wait till they're 18 or 21 or anything like that but they need we need to wait a little while we wait a little we wait through three months with adults a lot of times you know we'll wait to see if they want to really be a part of this church and they really want to they want to follow the lord and they really want to be baptized they really want to if that's what they really desire right they, so we're, we're careful about that. How much the more should we be with children? Be careful, but not overly in that sense, because nothing bad ever happened to a child that possibly after they make a profession of faith, if some years down the road, they come to a place where they don't believe they are saved and they they come to Christ and they get baptized again or scripturally baptized at that point. If you look at it from the Bible point of view, that doesn't mean that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not bad. We've never confused the two together with salvation, and we've also always preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been very specific about that, so not to confuse children, right? Which is very important. Anyway, Carroll continues summing up the findings of the Lutheran historian Moshim. He says this, Let it be remembered that changes like these here mentioned were not made in a day, nor even within a year. By the way, Brother, Brother Scott, the Lutheran historian Moshim, M-O-S-H-E-I-M. I don't think I have that book. Do you have it? For that, that set? That's, is it? How much is it? I've never seen it before. I've never seen it before. Okay, okay. Interesting, interesting. Because that's that's one I want to look at, even if I can find it digitally. Um, I don't think I don't think David Cloud has it or any of those guys have it in their listings of anything. And nobody's bought it. <laughs> well, not now it isn't. It's been taken off of your wish list. Anyway, but um, hey, we're you know what. I fully believe that one day th this is all be. I mean, and I use this library, but many more will use it. It'll get used. There's a wealth of knowledge of history and of study and of everything else there. So, amen. There may come a time when 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 th those old fashioned books are the ones that we have to have. Right. We'll be setting okay. <laughs> All right, but, but, but Moshim says here, he says, let it be remembered that changes like these here mentioned were not made in a day nor even within a year. They came about slowly and never within all the churches. So they started to, what did he say? Certain men crept in what? Unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. That's right. So they crept in the churches. So you wonder, like, well, how do some of these things happen in churches today? Like, how, how, did, how did we get to a place where, where you'd have a meeting that would be like, what's wrong, uh, how to get to the next level? 
you know, or, or what's wrong with churches that can't hit a thousand? Right? Yeah, their bathrooms are dirty. You got to sharpen up on this. You got to do that. You got to do that. Well, maybe God never meant those churches to hit a thousand. Right? We, we have free coffee. Look, we do. We have free coffee. Right. That's how they work. Um, but anyway, they, how did all that stuff happen? Well, the, it, crept, it creeps in. Right. For instance, you have, you have a, a modern-day example. You have churches like Dr. Lee Robertson's church way back in, uh, what is it, Highland Park? Back in the day, uh, in the 70s, right? The 60s, 50s, probably, 50s, 40s, or 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. You have those churches. Then off of them sprang a bunch of churches that had a college, did like things, and did that. Then you have the Hiles movement that came into the Baptist churches. And, and then, so, so then that, that philosophy of ministry spreads across over the time, over years, spreads across. But nobody bothers to ask, well, is it biblical? Well, some do. I shouldn't say nobody. A few select people stand up and say, no. Like, no. That's not right. The philosophies aren't right. The way they're organized are not right. The, the, the way that they run like a business is not right. All those, th- But that stuff crept in, and people saw the results of people like Hiles, and they said, well, I want those results. Well, that's what happened here. That's what happened in the third century. They started to see big churches. And they want they, then they then those big churches started controlling other churches. Right? And so then if you're not in their camp, then then you're in trouble. That's what started right, just like now. I I pointedly made sure by God's grace, and God made me make sure, uh, to put it bluntly, that I'm not in anybody's camp except Jesus's. I'm not, I don't, I I, I'm not in any of their camps. Like, I'm not, I, they try to invite me to their meetings, and I have no desire to go. I, I really, I, I've been invited to different groups of these people, and I don't want to be in any of their meetings. Why? Because I don't, well, I don't really agree with them. I have a hard enough time going on some tours that I go on. Um, because, and it isn't because they're not of like faith, and they're not real brethren or anything like that. It's just, I have a hard time shutting my mouth when I, I, I just, I do when I see things that are so blatantly right in front of me like that or that I disagree with, I'm just like, okay, well, whatever. You know, like I don't like their colleges. I, I, I'm I pointed. I don't like them. I think they stink. I think they smell like dookie. That's what I think. They, I, I, I hate the way they smell. I hate the way they are. I hate their colleges. I hate them. I hate the design of them. I hate sending off girls off, all the girls out of your church so nobody has anybody to marry, and you send them off to that Bible school somewhere, and then they meet some guy or something happens there, or they build that guy's ministry up there, and they do it. That's how this stuff started to happen. So it's not new. It's, it's not new. It happened before. Right? They came about slowly and never within all churches. Some of the churches vigorously, vigorously repudiated them like we do. They just said, no, we don't like it. It's not Bible. So much so that in AD 251, the loyal churches declared non-fellowship for those churches with, which accepted the, and practiced these errors. And thus came about the first real official separation among the churches. Thus it will be noted that during the first three centuries, three important and vital changes from the teachings of Christ and his apostles had their beginnings, and one significant event took place. Note this summary and and recapitulation. One, the change from the New Testament idea of a bishop and church government. This change grew rapidly more pronounced and complete and hurtful. Number two, the change from the New Testament teachings as to regeneration to baptismal regeneration. And number three, the change from believer's baptism to infant baptism. This last, however, did not become general nor even very frequent for more than another century. So, what three changes, here's your questions this week, what three changes took place in the third century? And number one, the change from the New Testament idea of a bishop and church government. The bishop and the church government change. Number two, the change from the New Testament teachings as to regeneration 
to baptismal regeneration. So that means salvation by baptism. Right? That's what changed. From regeneration being a uh, being born again by the Spirit of God to regeneration occurring in the water by baptism. And number three, the change from believer's baptism to infant baptism. Baptismal regeneration, infant baptism, these two errors have, according to the testimony of well-established history, caused the shedding of more Christian blood as the centuries have gone by. That's why men like Charles Spurgeon would say, say infant baptism is, is the badge of Antichrist. That's extra credit if you remember that one. He said infant baptism was the badge of Antichrist, and it is. It absolutely is. Why? Because it's completely counterfeit. But it gives a form of religious, of, of, uh, of being religious, but it's vain religion. It denies the power thereof. What, what happened? Certain men crept in unawares, which before of old ordained unto this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Denying. How? They denied it through infant baptism. That was the denial. Okay. It says here that more than, it says here that, that caused the shedding of more Christian blood as centuries have gone by than all other errors combined or than possibly have all wars not connected with persecution. If you will leave out the recent world war, over 50 million Christians died martyred deaths, mainly because of their rejection of these two errors during the period of the Dark Ages alone, about 12 or 13 centuries. Over 50 million, and that's estimate. I think it's more like 150, but 50, over 50 million. Why? Well, when you come, when they came into the valleys of Piedmont, and in the valleys of Piedmont, if they wouldn't baptize their babies, and they rejected the Pope's baptism because they called the Pope Antichrist. They said he's Antichrist. They would throw the children, they would throw the women, they would throw the people off the cliffs. They would bash their babies heads against the stones. They would drown them. Ulrich Zwingli would drown them, the Anabaptist, right, in Switzerland. He would drown them. Zwingli would, right? So um, the, the, the others that, that denied, that, that would not uh, succumb, he called it their third baptism, right? So these are these people this would these errors would go on see theological errors they have everlasting impacts they impact being wrong in your theology okay all right let me ask you this maybe you'll get this let's see if you'll get this here what doctrine would Zwingli have been wrong about that would lead him to do what he did to those Anabaptists. I would agree with that. I would say that would be part of it. But what's, it, what's an even broader one, an even bigger one? Because I, me as a bishop, I, only, I have a limited amount of authority. What is, what is my main, what, besides the Holy Ghost of God, my, that's right, church autonomy, but my main, um, in, my main duty is to influence you. Not to what? Control you. I'm not there to force you to do anything. I get accused of it all the time by people. They've accused me ever since I've pastored of, uh, of, of trying to, I've never forced anybody to do anything ever. Well, that's not true. I force my kids to obey, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, but they're my children, right? But, but I don't force anybody. Why? Because I don't, okay, I don't do it by the point of the sword. I was looking for Luke's sword. But uh, I don't do it by the point of the sword. What did Zwingli believe? He believed he had a mandate from God to kill you if you disagreed. Dominionism, that's correct. So exactly, because it's the same spirit, because Rome is the mom of Islam. 
Now, if you understand, if you understand that, that then it's all antichrist and beast control. So what these churches would end up being, what would come from this after the centuries go on, you're eventually going to get to the Roman Catholic Church and the hierarchy and the power and the control and the beast system that would combine the two keys, the temporal and the spiritual. It's, it's coming up to that. How? Because they deviated from local church doctrine. Because if they didn't, guess what? Well, no one would care what some church in Rome says. Like me, I don't care what the Pope says. Right? Unless it's funny, yeah. I don't, I mean, if the Pope puts out a decree, I laugh at it. Right? Amen! I do, don't I? I mean, I don't. If, if some Baptist, if some other Baptist pastor says that 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 I need to do something, I'm just like, yeah, okay, whatever. Thanks for telling us. Thanks for sharing. It's like the internet when people get on the uh, on the Googles and the YouTubes, and the internets, right? When they when they when they get on there and they they tell you, uh, you know, what you're supposed to do, how I'm supposed to pastor, and what I'm supposed to do, and all those things. I just I, that's why I laugh at them. Right? Because who cares? Why? Because we're, we're a local church only. We don't, we don't care what they say. They don't have any control over us. They don't have any power over us. Right? Okay, so th there's those errors there. All right. Baptismal regeneration. So a lot of people were killed. A lot of Christians died. Three significant facts for a large majority of the, of the many churches are clearly shown by history during these first three centuries. Number one, the, separate, the separateness and independence of the churches. They were all separate and independent. That, that's, just, that's the way God made them. To the church of the, to the, church of Ephesus, right? To the, church of the, uh, uh, to the Corinthian church. All these churches were separate. None of them were some big conglomerate. They were all separate entities. Number two, the subordinate character of bishops or pastors. And number three, the baptism of believers only. You know, bishops and pastors are to be, they're, they're to be confined to the scriptures. I don't have the temporal power or the spiritual power of the Pope. He doesn't have it either. He just thinks he does. But I don't. I don't have that. What do I have? The only limit of authority I have is through the scriptures. It's through what God has given. This is through the scriptures, right? So, but the Pope and others, they would start to be, these other men that would arise would take on authority that they didn't have. And because many of these men were pious men, they were accepted. And see, a lot of times you don't have to worry about those men because their motives are most of the time pure. It's if you set up an antichrist system like that, you have to be more concerned with who comes after them. Right? Exactly. Because the ones that come after it can cause a lot of harm. How significant that Mr. Carroll should mention the deaths of 50 million during the Dark Ages across Europe. These are not flippant figures. The figures are based on the writings of the enemies of God's people. What this means is that more people were murdered for the cause of Christ concerning simple faith and the rejection of the sacraments than any other calamity known to man. May God forgive us of our complacency in forgetting these pitiful martyrs. That's one of the reasons why we review the martyrs here. That's why we do. We tell of their story. Now, we're going we're gonna to get into a little bit here. Um, I'm going to read from Trail of Blood here a little bit, and then I'm going to get into a few of the other men, and then we'll be done here. But uh, listen to what he says here about this period. Under the strange, he's talking the period AD 30 to 500. Under the strange but wonderful impulse and leadership of John the Baptist, the eloquent man from the w wilderness, he's going to start with him. I'm going to move forward because we've already done that history, okay? Uh, let's see. Number, let's see, number three. More than 100 years had gone by before all had ha all this had happened. This hard persecution by Judaism and paganism continued for two more centuries, and yet mightily spread the Christian religion. It went into all the Roman Empire, Europe, Asia, Africa, England, Wales, and about everywhere else where there was 
any civilization. The church is greatly multiplied and the disciples increase continually. But some of the churches continue to go into error. The first of these changes from the New Testament teachings embraced both policy and doctrine. In the first two centuries, the individual churches rapidly multiplied, and some of the early ones, such as Jerusalem, Antioch, Ephesus, Corinth, etc., grew to be very large. Jerusalem, for instance, had many thousands of members, possibly 25 or even 50,000 or more. A close student of the book of Acts and the epistles will see that Paul had a mighty task even in his day in keeping some of the churches straight. See Peter and Paul's prophecies, which we talked about. The great, these great churches necessarily had many preachers or elders. Some of the bishops or pastors be, began to assume authority not given them in the New Testament. They began to claim authority over other and small churches. They, with their many elders, began to lord it over God's heritage. Here was the beginning of an error which was grown and multiplied into many other seriously hurtful errors. Here was the beginning of different orders in the ministry, running up finally to what is practiced now by others as well as Catholics. Here began what resulted in an entire change from the original de democratic policy and government of the early churches. This irregularity began in a small way even before the close of the second century. This was possibly the first serious departure from the New Testament church order. See, they started in the 2nd century, then you head down to the 3rd century, and the errors get worse. The control by different groups, different, different bishops starting to control other churches. Another vital change which seems from history to have had its beginning before the close of the 2nd century was on the great doctrine of salvation. So they started to mix in baptismal regeneration like we talked about. I'm not going to get into some of those yet. Just because we're going to talk about the sacraments later. The next serious error began to creep in, which seems to be for some historians, not all, to have begun the same century. This is what he talks about, baptism and regeneration. I'm going to save that. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Let's see here. Yep, we talked about that. Okay, we got that already. Okay. Good. Okay, we got that already. Good. Okay. Oh, here it is. Here's a quote from Moshim as well. Uh, in volume 1, page 71 to 72. But whoever supposes that the bishops of this golden age of the church correspond with the bishops of the following centuries must blend and confound characters that are very different. For in this century and the next, a bishop had charge of a single church, which might ordinarily be contained in a private house. Nor was he its lord, but was in real reality its minister or servant. All the churches of those primitive times were independent bodies, or none of them subject to the jurisdiction... Of any other. For though the churches were, were founded by the apostles themselves, frequently had the honor shown them to be consulted in doubtful cases, yet they had no judicial authority, no control, no power of giving laws. On the contrary, it is clear that as the noonday, that all Christian churches had equal rights and were in all respects on a footing of equality. So they, they didn't look at, they might have asked some of those more prominent churches for advice in something. But they weren't to control them. It's just like the council in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's council didn't control Antioch. No. Somebody came down from Jerusalem, which we'll get to when we get to that part of Acts. But someone came down from Jerusalem. Two men came from Jerusalem. Whether they were sent there or not, no one knows, really. But it doesn't appear they were. But two men came down to, Jeru uh, came down to Antioch and started preaching heresy and saying they had to keep the law to be saved. Well, that did, well what happened was... Paul, the whole place was in uproar, so Paul and I think it was Barnabas or Silas, I can't remember which one, they were sent back up to Jerusalem to try to get it figured out. So they took, they took and they went back to Jerusalem, and they, and they had a council there, and that council, that, they consulted the council of those churches, and that certain from James came, he was the pastor there, and James decided, uh, according to the scriptures under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that these things weren't necessary and that we did not preach that the Gentiles had to keep the law. So anyway, so that's an example of that, of consulting a church. But also it's because that church sent some men that were wrong and they came and infected their church and they had a problem with that. So they wanted to get it taken care of right away. All right, let's see here. Let's see if I want to read any more of this. That I'm going to wait for Constantine because we're going to get into we're going to get into Constantine here. Uh, let's see here. I think I've got Armitage marked here that I'd like to bring you some things about. Just tell you a little bit about what he said about the times.
Hang on one second. Put that down here. And then we'll be just a few more things, and then we'll be done. I like how Armitage puts it here. He says this, this century was marked by the introduction of a centralized church government, largely to the de destru destruction of congregationalism and by a crystallization of the ideas and pretensions of the episcopacy. Now, let me stop here and say this. You want to know why the juggernaut of the United States government is the way it is? Centralized government. That's not how this little republic started. When Benjamin Franklin walked out and, and the lady asked him, what kind of government have you given us, Mr. Franklin? And he said, a, re a republic if you can keep it. Well, it's not a republic any longer. It's an empire. It ceased to be. A re when do you think it's Jacob? When do you think it ceased to be a republic? Thank you. It's exactly what had happened. Right, and everybody paints the South as the most racist, awful, terrible people. When in all reality, the reason why they hate the South so much is it reminds them of the old country. That's why they hate it so much. They hated it because of the revival. They hated it because it was a Bible beltway. They hated it because many people were saved. They hated it because the Pope was getting his revenge on the South and the King James Bible. No. By the way, if anybody ever tells you that Civil War was about slavery and that was the design of the Civil War, they've been hanging out in the North way too long. And they got the wrong school books because that's a lie. It was, not about, it was not about slavery. If anybody in this country really thinks that, I challenge you, I challenge, I challenge you on two things. Number one, you've never studied it. You, you just never studied it. And number two, you were probably raised up North where what they taught you was what they what exactly they taught you was is that everybody down south were just a bunch of racist and uh, and just wanted to keep black people as slaves and that's why they that that's a, and and Abraham Lincoln went to free the slaves that's what it was all about and Lincoln was the savior well that's a cute story but it's not true it's not true by the way and do you know something else it doesn't mean I agree with everything that the South did to say that. It doesn't mean that I agree with forms of slavery. It doesn't mean that I agree with that. It doesn't mean that. What does it mean? It means that I can think and I can read and I know that their narrative is a lie. It is a absolute lie because there were plenty of slaves in the North. Plenty of them. It's just, it's... Anyway, you were going to say something. I don't know how I got off on that, but it just bothers me. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Right by the sword. Right. Well, exactly it is. Because, by the way, all the states had the right to secede. That's really what the, that's really what the, what the Civil War was about, was the right to secede. Because guess what? If the South wanted to have slavery and the North was right, then guess what would have happened? You would have let them secede, they would have seceded, and they would have, they would have failed miserably, and everybody would have ran up north. Or they would have changed their policies, which was going to happen anyway, with the rise of machinery and equipment that was coming anyway on the horizon and all these industrial revolutions and things that were coming anyway that were going to come to pass, right? You would, you would have done away. They were doing away with it. Does that mean that you condone everything that they did? No, of course not. It just means that it's not tr the narrative is not true. The narrative of the white plantation man down there being the most racist guy in the world killing black people all day long and raping women? Not true. But Sherman and those other men that crossed the border into the South and raped all those Southern women and burned their, and burned their villages down? And I, I don't have time to get started. If I get started on that, it'll take forever. And it's not, it's not. Anyway, centralized government. That's the point. That's my point. It's just, if you, be, if you believe everything you hear, first of all, if the media, the Democrats and the Republican are all pushing something, then I'm standing back and I'm like, well, I don't believe any of you. 
Because you all kill babies and you're wicked as hell, so I don't believe any of you. If you'll murder babies and pay for it, I don't believe anything you say. Right? But that's the narrative that's been pushed. So good little northerner, northerners up here believe everything they're told. They believe everything. They believe every, and they believe they were righteous. And that it was a righteous cause to go invade somebody else's land and take it. But that wasn't like treating those people like slaves. Like you weren't doing the same thing to them. You weren't enslaving them and burning down. Anyway, all right, I'm going to keep going. I don't care. I don't care because I, I, it doesn't matter to me. The point is that it's, it's the truth. It's like study it out and see if it's true or not. There's, a, there's another side of the story. There's, a, there's another side of the story. Right? I know they do. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So this century was marked, but the point is that centralized government is always bad. Always. We have a juggernaut that you can, you can, you can cheat on an election, have 100 million ballots. You could do, why can you do all that stuff? Because you're a juggernaut too big for anybody. Who can do an oversight of that government? Who? They do their own oversight. And they say, hey, we're right. Okay. It's like they go like this. Okay, good job. Good job. That's who does their oversight. They do. They do it. And then they give themselves a raise for doing it. And I'm supposed to believe what they say. Right. Anyway. As to the first of these, Neander clearly shows how cr a crude notion arose concerning the inward unity of a universal but unseen church and the outward unity of a church dependent on outward forms. Out of this speculative idea came the purpose to form one great organic body, which should take the place of the church family idea. Sound familiar? As Christ founded it on, social, on the social nature of man, the first step was to depress the individuality of the church in this or that home locality, supplanting it with the church of the district. Then, of course, would follow that of the nation and of the world. Cyprian carried this thought to its sound logical conclusion in his remarkable book on the unity of, of the church. Written about the middle of this period amid the confusion with which his, this innovation had to contend. The term Catholic Church is first found in the epistle of the church at Smyrna, in which Polycarp prays for the godly throughout the world under that name, and Tertullian uses it for the same purpose. But the organic Catholic Church itself arose out of the ambitious schemes to sap the foundations of congregational liberty and to crush heretics. So, see, their goal was to crush heresy. So in order to crush it, we got to create some big juggernaut. And that big juggernaut will keep all the heretics, and everybody will be unified. Every church will have the same doctrine. If they don't, well, we'll kill them. Then we'll kill all nonbelievers and all heretics. Then you won't be able to infect us. Now you're seeing how that formed. We read such folly as this from the pen of Cyprian. That man cannot have God for his father who has not the church for his mother. Where there is no church, sins cannot be put away. He is also the father of that far-fetched threadbare coat argument in which so many complacently wrap themselves till they, sp till they split it between the shoulders. You know what argument he's talking about? Yeah, it's funny. He says, our Lord's seamless vest. This coat possessed of unity which came down from the top, that is from heaven, which was not to be rent. He who parts and divides the church cannot have Christ's garment, as if Christ's church is Christ's coat in any sense, and as if his wool and raiment woven on some family loom in Palestine and raffled for by the soldiers at the foot of the cross could be forced to do duty as the symbol of his ransom body, the church. That's what they did. They said, the church is like this coat. See how the, that's like origin talk. That's like, you know, and that, that coat needs to say the same. There is not the slightest hint in the Bible that the bodily dress of Christ was the embodiment of anything but its own threads, much less that it was made by him a holy symbol of his redeemed people. Yet those who are shaking in their shoes all the time about some figment 
which they call the sin of schism, but which they are careful never to define, are perpetually quoting Cyprian's nonsense as if it were unanswerable Bible truth. Again, Cyprian, there is no salvation to any except in the church, which to him was true by the dimension of the church as he measured it, which measurement happily differs several cubits from the enlarged fullness in which Jesus comprehends all who love and obey him in sincerity and truth. Cyprian also held that there was no true baptism outside of the Catholic ranks, and so he rebaptized all heretics and schismatics who came to him while Stephen contended that if the due forms had been observed in baptizing them, they should be readmitted simply by the laying on of hands. As to the prerogatives of the episcopacy, the hierarchy was not established at once. Like all other perversions of great principles and institutions, the decadence was gradual, almost imperceptible, until the change became thorough and radical. When the priest had taken the place of the teacher and the church the place of the diffused congregations, then the church alone could confer salvation by its priesthood, ordinances, and discipline. I sat there in front of a Lutheran guy one time when I first got saved. He was a Lutheran pastor, and I asked him, is there salvation outside of the church? And he said, no. I think so, yeah. Could have been. But he didn't, be he didn't believe that there was any salvation outside of the church. There's no salvation outside of Christ. Christ is the door to heaven. Christ is the door to eternal life. The church is not the door to eternal life. For the whole power of the church was merged into the clergy. New forms produced new laws and new offices. Division in the churches had opened the way for one pagan practice after another in government as well as doctrine until the spirit of the old Roman imperialism gradually formed a priestly hierarchy. See, that's how it formed. They took the Roman Catholic government or the Roman government, the empire, and they started merging it in with the bishops. What Westcott calls the local and dogmatic ideas of Catholic Catholicity remained in germ and were latent till new circumstances broke the force of public opinion. One emergency followed another in breaking up the system of separate church action and compelling the churches to conform to one regime. You mean like the government today? The federal government? What have we seen? Oh, one emergency after another. So the whole country's got to be locked down and everybody and government has to be centralized. Everybody has to go the same way. Why? You just create an emergency and then they all have to follow in line. And then it's easy for you because you don't have to use your brain and be like, I'm not going to, I don't agree with that. Then the ecclesiastical form of the sin of schism was cautiously created as a bugbear. Its seeds be being planted in the restriction of free thought. Imperialism became the bulwark of the episcopacy, which at first operated gently. For after district prelacy was established, each district became independent for a time of all others, managed its own affairs by its provincial synod. The public mind had been educated to this form of government and civil affairs. So what did they do? They took the church government and they made it like this, the, the civil government. But Jesus told us what the form of government should be. Jesus told us exactly how the church was to be governed. But they chose to take on a different form of government. They chose to model it after Rome. And I don't mean the Roman Catholic Church. I mean the Roman government, the empire. The Greek actually was more modeled after Greek government. It began to. This policy had failed in the Greek Republic and had been lost in her wider dominion. But when Rome conquered all states, its idea of government was centered in one irresponsible will and sought its golden age there. In like manner, these simple Christian communities passed step by step into the hands of their ambitious brethren who sought to imperialize the churches. The bent of the Roman church was to adopt the policy of the Roman state and to swallow up all these artless families into itself. The necessary result was that the primitive sense of personal union with Christ was sunk into incorporation with the general church to be connected with which was salvation. After this, everything savored of Episcopal prerogative. Nothing of this was known in the apostolic churches, for there no particular man was distinguished as a priest much less as a high priest of priests. Bishop Lightfoot says in his Christian ministry, the sacerdotal title is never once conferred upon them. The only priests under the gospel designated as such in the New Testament are the saints, the members of the Christian brotherhood. As individuals, our Christians are alike, are all alike. 
The highest gift of the Spirit conveyed no sacerdotal rite, which was not enjoined by the humblest member of the Christian community. Yet the men of the third century reasoned that as pag paganism had found strength in a centralized government, Christianity could not cope with it without using the same forces. Hence, in substance, if not in form, the rule of the Galilean peasant was thrown aside, and the image of the emperor put in the place of by an episcopacy, first to charm and then to govern. Christ was a simple peasant. His government was so simple that any church could follow it. This, this church that you're in today, tonight, this church that you sit in that you're a member of is a model that could be, that could be practiced in any house, in any dwelling, in any tent, in any place, in any time. Because it's a simple church model. It can be practiced anywhere. Why? Because God founded it. He designed it that way. That's why. It's not because we're something special. No, you see, what, I, what happened to me is after, after I got ordained and sent out, I, before that, I started to look at things, and I was like, I looked at all these. And by the way, I didn't like a lot of those things anyway. But I looked at a lot of things, and I, I started to be like, you know, this, this stuff isn't. It isn't necessary. It took me a while to learn some things and to read some things and to study. And it's like, you know what? A lot of this stuff is like should be done away with. A lot of it should be done away with. It's not necessary. This design could be re reproduced anywhere. Amen. It truly could be. All right. Let's see here. Where are we? Let's see. The highest gift of the Spirit conveyed no sacerdotal right. Yes, the men of the third century reasoned that as paganism had found strength in a centralized government, Christianity could not cope without it without using the same forces. Hence, in substance, if not in form, the rule of the Galilean peasant was thrown aside. After that, a technical sense was attached to the term bishop, which never fell from apostolic lips, the corruption of the term springing from the corruption of the office. The first grade of departure is found in the mutual con consultation of the elders as equals concerning the welfare of few churches in their vicinity. Then one of them began to exercise lordship over the other. Till in the opening of this age, the city elders assumed rank and authority over their suburban brethren who were but common country folk. Because Rome was the mighty capital and the church there strong, this church early betrayed that feeling. Besides, the smaller churches were, so, were often quite dependent upon those out of which they came, cherishing great love for them, and so were led by their influence. Roman society, society daily familiarized men with all the grades and successions of power, and it required constant resistance to keep the churches in their Christ-like simplicity of government. Look at it today. Churches have taken on the world's example. You have these structuralized education and colleges and the way that they do things. They're, they're businesses. The health department comes in and says, we're shutting you down. They have their business license. They have their incorporation. The state says they're going to fine them. We're going to fine you a million dollars. Go ahead. We're going to find you. These big name colleges have a lot to lose. So they're, they, they fall in line and they, they obey the government. Right? And then when they were shut down and they became too big and, they, and it cost them a lot of money, then they took hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars from the federal government in order to cover their losses. Which I'll be honest with you, if you... First of all, if you stopped showing up for church, I'd come looking for you, and we'd ask you why. Amen. We'd ask you why. But second of all, if something happened and you stop and, and you stop giving to the Lord's work because we couldn't assemble for a week or two or something of that nature, well, that's on your own heart. That's between you and the Lord. I see. I get all these things that people send me, like that one thing, Dave, that somebody sent me. Who are made nameless, but um, uh, that 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 thing right there that somebody sent me, and then other things that people send me about about offerings being down. I mean, actually, they weren't really. I mean, we really didn't have any of that. We didn't really have that. 
I mean, sometimes they're down. I don't tell you every time they're down, but sometimes they are. But the thing is, is that it's nothing should really change that much. If your model is simple, not a lot should change. Obviously, if the economy crashed, nobody had any money, weren't making any money, and all you know, all that stuff, then obviously that would change some things. Right? But the point is, is that these things merged into this big, huge, massive government that started to rule over others, other churches. Right? And they started to take on the governments, the, 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 their government, their local government's model. Because the pagans, man, the pagan systems worked good, so we'll go ahead and take it on and we'll do the pagan system. Never mind what the scripture said. Right? Just like I find it interesting that, I'm not going to mention where or what or whatever, but a church that, that I know of that one of their teachers that was an employee had an illicit relationship with a young lady. And they didn't talk about it. People had a lot of questions. People were bothered by it. And all they did was stand up and say, well, so-and-so was fired, and they, they moved on, and they left. And now they're serving there. And that leaves everybody in question to wonder, like, well, and they all know about it because people are talking about it mad. And they all know about it, but nobody deals with it, right? They never dealt with it. They, they just, they never did, right? So, and the, the excuse that was given was that, oh, well, legally, because they were employee, we can't say anything. Really? So I think you're using that as an excuse. I don't know how that works. But I would say this. You better ditch the way you're organized if you can't call sin, sin. Because what you just said was, I can't obey the scriptures because of my incorporation. And that doesn't bother you? But I... <laughs> Wisdom is justified of her children. Because I'm telling you, I had these same people say they couldn't recommend a church that was not 501c3 for the protection of the people. Think about it. So the very thing that you said is the reason why you're incorporated is the very thing that didn't protect your people. And that now sin doesn't, because before that guy, before that guy was fired, you better believe that his self would be standing in front of all those people right there admitting what he did. And if he didn't, then he didn't. But, but I would do whatever I could to make sure he did. Right? But we can't because of the corporation, because of the legal. Well, then guess what you can't do then? You can't obey the scriptures, which means you signed a deal with the devil. And those deals are meant to be broken. Yeah, exactly. The credit... The credit of Cyprian as to the almost miraculous effects of the ordinances and divine authority of episcopacy strengthened these tendencies in Africa where he acted in a childish manner. In a letter to Pupianius, he says, The bishop is in the church, and the church is in the bishop. And if any one be not with the bishop, he is not in the church. That is, that is scary right there. Neander thus expresses himself most freely. A candid consideration cannot fail to see in Cyprian a man animated with true love to the Redeemer and to his church. It is undeniable that he was honestly devoted as a faithful shepherd to his flock and that it was his desire to use his Episcopal authority for the maintenance and order of discipline. But it is also certain that he was not watchful enough against self-will and pride. The very point he contended for the supremacy of the Episcopate proved the rock whereon in times 
he made shipwreck. Just like what we just talked about. Isn't that a perfect example? Well, we, we got to have the corporation to protect the people. So we have to firmly stand with the corporation. We have to have that because that protects people. But then the very thing that you did that, you made shipwreck with. And it can happen to any of us. I, I, I'm, I'm, it can happen to any of us. What's that? It is a lack of faith. That's the one thing the Lord called us to here when we, some of you weren't here when we separated and, uh, and, or, and decided not to be 501c3. Some of you weren't here. Who was here at that time? Let's see, Rachel was here. Dad was here. Lee was definitely, and Carrie were definitely here. You weren't here. You were here, Luke. What were you, four? I'm just kidding. You're 11. Bright young boy that boy was. Right? Joshua was in high school, I think, when we did that. That was Skippy peanut butter year for you. No, that was Joshua. Joshua and Angela were chewing bubble gum in high school. Oh, you were. Okay. You're a little bit older than that then. Well, it took you ten, 10 years extra, so I'm glad you were finally graduating. You were 21 when you graduated? Oh. <laughs> you went to public school. Is it too easy sometimes? I got it. <laughs> Andrew's like, you're going to give that kid a complex. <laughs> oh. oh. I should quit calling Jacob a kid. He's 30 now. You're getting old, Jacob. Grandpa. Anyway. All right, I'm going to read you one thing, then we'll get out of here. <laughs> I went long here. I always go long. I can never make it short. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> he get it's like a motor that revs up. It's very distinct that sound. I wonder if Carly runs around with earplugs all day. You just like put them in or what? Maybe she does. Or you're a mom and you have that. Moms have that filter where it doesn't bother them, and guys are like, I, you know, they're they're like, stop screaming, rightly, rightly. <laughs> All right, I'm going to finish with this here, then, then we'll be done. I'm not going to get to the catechumen. I will save the catechumen for the next doctrinal one on the sacraments, but I will cover this these this page with you here quickly here. From the confidence in, in AD 170, we're backing up just a little bit, but this, it kind of talks about the segue into that. Uh, from the confidence of the church that the church had in their ministers when the distance was great, the affairs of the churches were entrusted to a deputation of elders and deacons with others. From these friendly meetings arose a sort of republic association of the churches in a particular province. The, metro, the, the, metro, the metropolis being the most centric was usually the place of a meeting. At first, the office of president seemed generally to have been elective and to have continued no longer than the sessions of the synod. The bishop of the place where the association was held from a sort of natural title to preside in the convention came by the gradual but but sure operation of custom to be regarded as the head of the body. This in time, aided by other auxiliary causes, established a metropolitan bishop, which when fully matured, gave a seat and conferred authority on the papalist, papistical monster. So it's what started the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. During the greater part of this century, Christian churches were independent of each other. Now, nor were they joined together by association, confederacy, or any other bonds but those of charity. Each Christian assembly was a little state governed by its own laws, which were either enacted or at least approved by the society. But in a process of time, as above noticed, all the churches of a province were brought into one ecclesiastical body. With this accumulating corporation, a desire prevailed among ministers to increase the number of adherents to their respective interests. But instead of increasing their ministerial exertions and giving a simple exhibition of divine truths, as it is in the first planting of Christianity, the pastors increased the numbers of rites and ceremonies in their Christian worship. Thus, an accommodation was afforded to Jews and pagans, and their conversion facilitated to sophisticated doctrines of the cross. As the boundaries of the church were enlarged, come on in. By an easier ingress, the number of vicious and irregular persons who entered into it proportionally, proportionably increased. So they grew in size and numbers, and they, they all started out with good causes. 
all these associations, just like Sandy Creek and all those others, they started out with good causes, but in the end, they don't work out so well. Why? Because local church authority is always the best. God's design is always the best. Right. When you add to those things, it never works out well. It never ends good for the home team. Never. Right? Most of the churches at the end of this century assumed a new form. As the old disciples retired to their graves, their children, along with the new converts, both Jews and Gentiles, under new ministers from the Alexandrian school, came forward and new modeled the cause. When the evil of the new system had developed itself, a new course of discipline was adopted, but the character of the community was changed, and purity with primitive simplicity took leave of such a mixation. The ceremonies introduced occasioned strife and discord. Victor, Bishop of Rome, insisted upon Easter being observed by the Asiatic churches at the same time it was kept by the Western. So they had a fight over timing of, of Easter. His authority and request being disregarded, he thundered out his excommunication against the Orientals. What do you have against Orientals? This conduct in Victor broke the friendly communion which had been before subsisted between the churches in the East and the West. Having now traced the features of the churches generally and finding their assumption of power with their aspect and composition of an anti-Christian character, we must dissent from these and leave them, directing our investigation to other claimants until we can trace some honorable and scriptural distinction. So we're going to end there, too. And where we pick up and who are we going to pick up with? Well, after we get through the next one, we're going to pick up with the Donatist. Yeah, and then we're going to talk about Constantine, and there's a lot. And I, I may park there for a while. We may be on Constantine and the Donatist for a while. There's a lot there with them. So multiple lessons on that. Because you have to understand what, what took place with Constantine, because it's very deceptive, very deceptive, what happened. And that's how Satan operates, but we'll get to that later. Let's pray. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your church. Lord, it seems like time goes by so fast when we're together, and we thank you for it. Help us to always cherish it, Lord. Help us to love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Help us to give unto each other our hearts, our lives, our talents, our abilities, our strengths. And help us, Lord, to sharpen one another in our weaknesses. Help us to love each other and be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and to put on the whole armor of God. Bless your church, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.